Ticketweb.com is the longest running Everton website with an archive of more than 35,000 articles. This is the Toffee Web Podcast. Hello, Evertonians, and welcome back to the Toffee Web Podcast. It's our third episode during the break for the World Cup, which is already at the semi final stage. And with all of Everton's representatives now out of the competition, thoughts are starting to turn to Boxing Day and the resumption of the Premier League when Wolves come to Goodison Park, hopefully bearing gifts. It's a month to the day since Everton last kicked a ball in anger. Have you missed it, Blues? Or does another fortnight without watching the Toffees sound rather appealing at this point? Paul Trail and Adam McCulloch are here with me, and we'll start looking ahead to that Wolves game on the 26th, that oh-so-typical FA Cup third-round draw, and the ongoing discussions around the board in the wake of that latest open letter to Farhad Mashiri from the 27 campaign. But given that the last Tuffy Web pod was about Goodison and the 1966 World Cup, it's fitting that we'll start with a general chat about this year's edition in Qatar and welcome Paul McParland back to the podcast. Paul was part of that Heritage Society special, which, if you haven't already caught up with, it's really well worth a listen, and is always a terrific, terrific guest. So welcome back, Paul. Hi, Linda. Thanks for having me back on the show again. And it's brilliant to meet up with Adam and Paul again for the first time. Looking forward to an interesting discussion during, during this evening's pod. And yeah, I mean, the, uh, really enjoyed the 66 World Cup pod. Uh, it was a great listen to the exchange of stories, particularly Mike Goyden joining us as well. And uh, just in se- I think because of the 1966 World Cup, because I was 10 years old at the time, so all the games at Goodison, I've kind of I've been imbued with a love of the World Cup purely because of that, because my first experience kind of stuck with me, with me for life. So I've always been actively involved in watching the World Cup. In terms of this World Cup, uh, it's it's been a real kind of topsy turvy competition. It hasn't turned out in the way that anybody's expected. Uh, if you want me to focus on England. Uh, it was inevitable, wasn't it? You, you, you just kind of, you just kind of, you know. I think Everson, uh, England's record runs achievements is on a par with Everson, and it, it's always kind of a the, the reaction here has just kind of been this blithe acceptance of you know France were a better team, you know, they had a bit more luck on the day. Okay, it doesn't matter, we lost, we move on, and that is to me, to me that just uh, it's not a winning mentality, you know. Okay, we lost two on to, to France. A France team missing Paul Pogba, missing Kante, missing Benzema. So it wasn't even a full strength French team. And I just felt watching the second half, there were times when changes could have been made in the tactics and the approach to, to go for France. Because at one stage, France, I thought, were really were rocking. And then when we do make the changes, you know, you're big on Jack Grealish three minutes into stoppage time. You take off po- debatably our best player, Sacco, uh, and replace us. Replace us, Saka, and replace him. And you just kind of think, well, you know, is if I make a Premier League comparison, is Gallen Southgate the type of manager, like a David Moyes type manager, he'll get you so close to the top four, but he won't just get you over the line. And this kind of, a, you know, this universal acceptance that he's done a brilliant job and the players, you know, it's a young team and that young team will get better. If you cast your mind back to the 2018 semi-final, this assumption young players get better. There was a certain lad, young lad in that team, Delhi someone, Delhi Ali, I think, yeah, who was uh, the future yeah. in his football at the time. Yeah. And this is something that young players always get better. Actually, they don't. Some players have reached their peak already, and it's an erroneous assumption to work on the basis that young players always get better because so many things happen in football's career, they just don't. So, huge disappointment with England going out. Um, in terms of what's left of the competition, I think it's been absolutely brilliant for football that Morocco had progressed to the semi-finals. I think the, the, the support they brought has added a vibrancy to the stadiums, which sometimes international games lack. And I have to say, my uh, my ideal scenario would be a Morocco-Argentina final. I mean, Argentina have taken 50,000 fans out there for that competition. Incredible, I think the final... It? It's incredible, you know, the loyalty, the passion that those supporters generate. And uh, I just think, you know, a Morocco-Argentina final... Uh, would just be superb, and even more superb if Morocco were to to win and become the first African nation to 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 break up that duopoly of a European team and a South American team with the trophy year in year out. Couldn't have put it better myself. Uh, <laughs> I really missed uh, the blithe acceptance of an abject performance. That's obviously something <laughs> the, the podcast normally covers. Uh, with an Everton slam, but it was uh, yeah, you, you 
you could have transferred a lot of uh, a lot of those comments about the England performance against France uh, onto many of ours this season as well. Um, I think, yeah, from from a footballing point of view, moving away from uh, England, it, it has been really fun. I think sides like Morocco and Japan having that freewheeling style, really having a go at, at bigger teams and, and succeeding. Um, it's been it's been really good to see, and I guess from a, an Everton point of view, you're kind of hoping maybe the the quite sizable contingent who've stayed at home at Finch Farm have been paying notice and taking heed because it shows that there is something that you can do against these bigger sides, but there isn't just a, a lay down your guns mentality. You can get at these sides, and uh, yeah, Morocco in particular have been a lot of fun, um, some really good performances, and I, I, I like your dream final scenario Paul I think uh yeah th- th- there's a there's, there's definitely a sentimental option with with Messi who's who's been wonderful and uh and again a lot of fun but uh yeah a, a first African side to win it and I I, I couldn't think of a, a better fitting one because yeah they've they've been everyone's sort of other team and obviously I'm sure a lot of people even non-England fans will be rooting for um uh, for, for Morocco against France yeah, yeah, to agree. Morocco made the final. Made the final. That'd be amazing. Um, soft spot for for Croatia, to be fair. Um, just, I just love watching Modric. I mean, what a player! He just, he just knows what amazing, to do every he? time, doesn't he? He's just an incredible player. I probably underrated him a bit at, at Spurs. To be fair, he's really shone since being at Real Madrid. He's obviously been there quite a long time now, but I just love watching Modric. And um, I guess just in, before the tournament, I think you were saying, Lyndon, we've been in, in, just at the at the end of the. Uh, so when we when we hit the break, you say you'd like to see Messi get to the final in Argentina, go go quite far, and obviously they're getting to at least the semis. But I thought that until I watched that um, the the last game uh, for, for Argentina against the Netherlands, I thought I, I, I got really fed up watching Messi in that game, and I've always been a big fan of Messi. He I just felt like so, so sort of self entitled in that game. The referee seemed terrified to sort of give him, yeah, but see the one that give that really really blatant handball, and it was like. Come on, that's that's like the plainest yellow card you'll ever see, and that sort of favoritism really doesn't sit well with me at all. I didn't, I didn't like the way he he wasn't the only one. I didn't like the way he was performing in the game and acting, and Croatia act with a lot more class and dignity. So from now, if, if it was a, somehow a Croatia Morocco final, that'd be the dream one for me because it would be a total un, total undercard. Uh, winning the cup, and that's what Evan, <laughs> I guess, I try to aspire into me. We'll come on to the FA Cup a bit later on, and um, it might show again, as you said, Adam, it's possible. In terms of England, I slightly disagree a little bit, Paul, and that, like, I mean, I, I get what you mean in terms of, oh, you know, how long are you going to say, oh, you know, you come up against a good team, and oh, we're unlucky, but to be fair, they were a bit unlucky in this occasion. There's been plenty of times when they come up against against be- uh, better teams in World Cups, European Championships, and just stunk the place out. I thought in this one, yeah, okay, they blew it with the penalty, but they had much better chances in the game. And another day they do sneak home, and then everyone's like, it just feels like so bo- so kind of bipolar. They did the opinion over like um, over Gareth Southgate, and like uh, and then we draw with USA. Everyone's like, oh, get him out, he's rubbish. Beat Senegal. Everyone's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it just um, kind of seems that's the way it is with the with the sort of with the sort of English public. On that one, um, I just look if if you're thinking from an England fan perspective, then I look back at. We had that generation of players, like the amazing generation of players. We had Rio Ferdinand, Terry, Cole, Lampard, Gerard, Rooney, or Beckham, Scholes, all you know, all man about the same team and um, flunked under Sven, under Capello, under Hodgson. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I kind of I'd, I'd stick by Southgate personally from an England point of view. I, I, I wasn't one of as a club manager. But just seems to, I don't know, get more of a tune out of the players than we've seen and just kind of wonder, if it, is it better the devil you know? But at the same time, they were seeing being that guy, as you say, Paul, to, to actually be there holding a the cup for England. Probably not. So <laughs> maybe I'm I don't know, disproving myself there. But it's been it's been enjoyable, hasn't it? I think there's a lot of sort of bad talk going into the World Cup. Oh, God, this is going to be rubbish. But it's I've really enjoyed it. And I think World Cup and the Open Challenge, but particularly the World Cup, is still the premier competition for me. I just love how much it means to the nations. And it's just uh, it's always great to watch. Yeah. That 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 what you say about the how much it means that really comes to the fore because it is, you know, it's that that personal achievement married with kind of that national pride thing. I mean, just how much it means to these players is is amazing, and that's what was so great about those final group stage games where, you know, it was things were going back and forth just in, you know in in minutes 
Um, and so that's, I really hope that they find a way of keeping that, that jeopardy for the next World Cup, which, I don't know, the move to 48 teams is, is just ridiculous to me. I can't believe they've done it. I, I can, I believe it, because it's FIFA, but I, 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 it, it amazes me that they, uh, they keep messing with the competition. But, uh, yeah, the, the Gareth Southgate thing is an interesting one because, you know, in the Nations League, they've been pretty poor for quite a while. Um, but, but obviously, when they get to the, to the big stage, they seem to sort of go up a level, even while almost playing within themselves. I thought it's, it's ironic that they actually went out against France when they finally started actually expressing themselves a bit more and being a bit more attacking because I always felt like they were just holding themselves back in almost every match, particularly that USA game. Um, and you know, maybe it does that come down to Gareth Southgate not being perhaps the most dynamic personality? Maybe there's something there. Is he a bit, as you said, uh, Paul, but, but kind of David Moisey like, um, you know, in his uh, conservatism? Um, but I think in terms of him continuing, it's a the question of well, who comes in instead of him. Um, and I think in this, in with the current setup, I think there's probably a lot to be said for continuity. And just keeping him in the job and, and sort of working with with the sort of the, the key younger players because some of those younger players, as you say, not all of them might progress. I was thinking as you were, as we were talking earlier, just how maybe Wayne Rooney's best England tournament was the very first one he did, two thousand four, and he was never able sort of to re re uh, match those highs. So you'd hope that that's not the case for particularly um, Saka, who I thought was brilliant, um, and I just. I think the uh, the BBC Five live commentary raised the, the prospect that he might have actually gone off with an injury because he was getting kicked quite a lot in that game. And um, so I, I hope that's the case because he was, I think, the outstanding England player on the day. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 a shame that they didn't, you know, obviously get all the go all the way this time. And the narrative, I suppose, is is now, you know, in terms of the performance. Um, have they fallen down again when they've actually played the first time they've actually played a decent team? And I think had they, had they met anyone other than France, who I just think a couple of world-class moments just made the difference. It was that, it was that sort of finer margin. Um, I think if they played somebody else, they probably would have, would be in the, in the semis, but uh, you know, it's not to be. And, you know, as, as neutrals, I agree that the whole, the, the messy thing has disappointed me. Um, you know, in, in that question of who's the greatest player of all time, I always have that sort of personality um, dynamic as part of my criteria for it. You know, Pele was a gentleman. Maradona had his issues. Cristiano Ronaldo was doing everything he can to destroy his legacy. Um, and so, yeah, to see the way that Messi was kind of creating and that, you know, there was a lot of bad blood with the Netherlands in that match and the sort of the pictures of them, you know, goading them after the, the final penalty went in. And that's, yeah, it's, it's unsavory. I can understand, you know, you can understand it because there was a lot. They were getting very chippy at each other in that match. Um, but yeah, other, I, the, the tournament as a whole, I think it's been great. Uh, like you, uh, Paul M, the, my, my first tournament was the 86 World Cup. And so, yeah, the World Cup has always been really sort of close to my heart. So it's uh, it's been really fun to watch and I'll be... Yeah, I'll be disappointed when it's finished. Um, not least because <laughs> here come Everton. <laughs> and, uh, and there's you complaining about the 4018 World Cup. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I suppose that's true, but I don't know. There's, there's, I think there's, there's such a thing as too much of a good thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is the Toffee Web Podcast. On the note of um, of Emma, Everton's imminent return, I I'll be honest. I was fine for the first three weeks. I was great for the first three weeks. It was great not to sort of worry about Everton at all. But uh, seeing some of these players that either we've either used to be Everton players or were heavily linked with Everton and we never got them, um, and ones that we could potentially get who are all performing really, really well. It, the, the more I've sort of watched these players and realized we have no, ha, no chance in hell of getting them now, it's actually become, <laughs> starting to really depress me. And the combination of that 
I've been listening to some of the other podcasts um, that have been going on during the break, and there's sort of you know a lot of negativity around the board and all this kind of stuff. And I I, I don't know. I just had this sort of sense of impending doom. <laughs> I've definitely had that feeling. I I was watching the um, um kind of footage on YouTube that they put out. Um, that's not not the drone. Um, of the stadium but obviously the players arriving back and they're in the snow and Yerry Mean is smiling he's got his thumbs up and you know, there's a little <laughs> fist bump and uh and you kind of it, it feels a little bit like I don't know the parents have let the naughty kids babysit tonight and someone's I don't know Patterson's gonna leave leave the training ground vaping or something and, <laughs> uh, it's just all sort of I, I'm, I'm not I'm not that excited Purely, but also, I don't know if it was just coming coming back onto the pod or just maybe it was England going out. I'm I'm not totally sure, but as as my my mind has sharpened towards this thing on the horizon, which is Boxing Day, this big moment, I'm either gonna have really really missed watching Everton, and it's gonna bring all this wave of pure beautiful emotion uh, rushing back, or it'll hit me like a hammer blow, and I'll be I'll be back in that Bournemouth moment, in that week of just oh, wondering God. why, 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 why. Yeah. Um, there was there was another clip on social media. I think it was a, a Devante Tyres yeah. sponsored post showing a uh, Ruben Vinagre nutmegging someone in one of those Bournemouth games. Obviously, I don't remember it happening because uh, it was it was it was such a poor display. I think that was that must have been our our highlight. No, November. Adam. No, it didn't happen. Uh, that that, yeah. that was from the one of the games in in Australia. Oh, was it? Was it? Was it in Australia? Yeah, they just, they, honestly, right. they just had to say it. When I saw them, yeah. when I saw them score, whoever we were playing in Australia, I was like that, that red and black kit is just killing me. Thankfully, yeah. <laughs> so, like, scored a few more goals, but yeah, that make that makes more sense because yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't remember uh, Ruben Benagri doing anything so uh, confident on the ball uh, in either of those performances, but um, that makes more sense. But um, yeah. It's 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 worrying how close it is now. Um, I guess there's there's a strange kind of unknown quantity to what we're going to be coming up against with it being Wolves as well, because obviously they've had changes going on in the meantime as well. Um, but I think what what we do know and what we all felt um, certainly com- coming out of that that awful week was that. This this one coming up is a is a biggie, and the closer it gets, I think the more it's going to feel like a lot of those weeks we had last season, where it, you're almost ramping up like it's a cup game, like it like it's a World Cup, like it's a it's it's knockout football because it it really will start to feel like that if um, if we don't put in a shift. I'd agree, Adam. I think already it, it, it's it's potentially a six pointer at a, at a ridiculously early stage of the season. Uh, you know, we've won one out of the last seven games in the league. I mean, that's not an encouraging run of form to be approaching this game with as well. And I think looking back at that final week before the internet, before the World Cup break, um, the decisions made in that week have had huge consequences for for the mood around Goodison. I mean, we you could just about stomach the poor performance against Leicester. If that the response of being a league cup winner Bournemouth and a league winner Bournemouth, but neither of those two things happened. I think it was a calamitous decision to field a weakened team against Bournemouth in the league cup. It gave Bournemouth the initiative, gave them gave them boosting confidence. So they started the game on the Saturday on a high, which made it more difficult for us. It'd be interesting as well to see um how Wolves shape up because they've just appointed Lopestegui, who's a really, really experienced manager. You know, mm-hmm. he was Temporarily in charge of the Spanish team before the World Cup in 2018. He's been in charge of Real Madrid. He's done a fantastic job at Sevilla. He also he also has managed Porto. So he, he, I understand he's a really fluent Portuguese speaker as well. And, and at Wolves, that's a crucial element of, of the manager's role. So you, you do have some concerns about how Wolves are going to uh, approach that game, the new manager boost and all that. And uh, considering, that, considering our subsequent fixture is away at Man City, this is a game that really we need to get three points from because otherwise if we don't and then we have the inevitable loss at City, then come the start of twenty twenty three, we're back in the bottom three again. And that really is a situation that, you know, no one wants to be in. And you can only you know you can play Russian roulette with relega- with relegation so many times. And you, you really hope that this is the year that we don't actually get caught out. And I just think, you know, that game against Wolves, we need to come out, we need to get three points, we need to dissipate that mood of I think pessimism 
that's that, that's kind of enveloping Goodison Park at the moment because otherwise, if Wolves were to score one or two early goals and kind of dominate possession and play, I can see the atmosphere t- you know, t- turning a bit, and that's that's the situation we just don't want to be in. Yeah, that's very true. Um, yeah, there's a lot of angst about the game. You can't help that 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 sort of that horrible feelings in your stomach, isn't it, about this game? And you don't know. We shouldn't feel like that for Wolves at home. We really shouldn't. And, and team in the bottom three, we should we should be. Yeah, you know, how we've let ourselves get into this, that this position of that Palace game when we hammered them, and it was you know, oh, oh here we go. This is it. This feels so long ago now, doesn't it? It's um, yeah, it's horrible, really. And you're right, and if we don't win that game, I mean, you, you, you're kind of almost definitely saying that's, that's zero points from those two because we never get anything at Man City away. It's going to be very, very difficult to get anything there. So it's, um, yeah, it's it, it, it's it's very worrying. And Wolves are still in the League Cup, unlike us. Somehow they managed to stay in. They, they've got a game. They've got a chance to, I think it's like someone like Gillingham or something like that. I don't know. It's definitely a, low, a lower league. And they've got a chance to sort of, you know, go into that game, get a good win under the belts before coming to Goodison, you know. So they, they, they you know, they've got a new manager in. Their tails could be up. And yeah, you looked at off. You looked, you looked at that sort of video on on sort of Twitter of like the players sort of coming back and and all that. And yeah, you just think oh, we haven't got a lot there, have we? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you know, didn't, there's not loads to come back either. You know what I mean? You're thinking, is Dominic going to be fit? Do we know? I mean, is uh, you know, if not, are we relying on Cannon? Can we rely on Mope? As you said, is you know who's going to play instead of Cody? You know what I mean? Does uh, is mean of anything like fit? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not even like we're going in there full, you know, with like full available availability or knowledge of who's available or anything like that, you know. So it's um it's quite difficult to be optimistic into that going into that game, and uh, you just got hope that yeah they, they're coming down Goodison Road and the fans are doing their thing, and you know they maybe maybe it might actually end up being on the fans again to sort of to carry these lot once again for for, for this game at least, and then go into the game maybe the atmosphere is bouncing if we can get that early goal. In the game, it's going to be vital, as as you said, Paul. If if Wolves go ahead, you can just always see, you can always sense already that nasty goodness and atmosphere, which is never any good for our players like that, is it? So it's um, yeah, it's a it's a really worrying thought, and it's a, it's been nice to switch off from all this, hasn't it? And it's just uh, yeah, it's just coming back like a fleet train now, unfortunately. Denial. <laughs> yeah, but that that point you make about um, you know, the, the fans potentially being the key, I think that's the the uh, the one thing that makes me optimistic about it is I think that this this um, this hiatus that we've had and the, I think the closer we get there's going to be a lot more anticipation about it people are people are really looking forward to getting back to Goodison even if it's not to watch the team people just want to go back to the stadium they want that you know that they're they're back, but go back to their their match day rituals and the, you know the social aspect of it um, and I think that hopefully with with that as I say that kind of sort of pent up emotion. Um, and anticipation around this match. I'm hoping that we will get something a bit like what we had last season with some of those really, you know, magnificent atmospheres that really, I mean, really dragged us over the line. I mean, with massive amounts to um, to to keep us up. Um, Paul, and just because we haven't haven't sort of had you on talking about modern day Everton, uh, what what are your sort of feelings on Lampard in general? Um, and how his his performance over sort of the back end of last season and, and sort of beginning of this season. Yeah, quite, quite mixed really. I, I think you know, it's a, in, in Frank Lampard's defence, he's only been in post for less than twelve months. He's not. He's had two transfers. In fact, he's had, he's had one transfer window because he didn't get the first January window because he was appointed two days before the end of it. So I think I think he has to be given time. I think that you know. Um, what I like about me, he has a passion for the club. I think he understands what the fans' demands are. He turned down other jobs before he took the Everson job, so he, he's a man who appreciates what you know, what a big. He agrees with us that Everson are a big club, and they're not nationwide. Not ever has that same opinion of us. And so I, I like the way he's brought us into the club. I think his recruitment's been been excellent during the summer. I think we've brought us some really good quality. Onan looks a, a, a really good prospect. Quite excited about him as well, um, and. <clears throat> I think he identified the areas of the team that needed change in midfield in particular, where we were getting outrun all the time last year. His defensive signings have, ha, have added a degree of solidity to the team. I think Cody and Tarkovsky are such a massive upgrade on Holgate and Keane. 
But the question at the end of this all is, why aren't we doing better? Why are we one point out of the bottom three? Why have we only won one game in seven? So somewhere along the way, something isn't quite gelling. I'm not quite sure no, where you put where you put the blame for that. I, mean, I, I, I remember watching last season, Paul Clement was posting all these videos on YouTube of how they've improved the, defense, <clears throat> the defensive marking for set pieces and the like, and there's been a definite improvement there. Mm-hmm. When people ask me, well, what thing about Everson this season? I think we're a much better team than last season. I'm, I'm convinced of that. But somehow the results have not matched the performance at all. <clears throat> and I just think, <clears throat> I, I, I just worry that, you know, for, uh, for a manager to be under this level of, to be drawn into a second relegation fight within 12 months of starting the club, it, it, it's a massive, massive ma- amount of tension, stress. So if you put me on the spot, I think we stick with Lampard. You know, we, we see where we are at the end of the season, give him another transfer window to see what what, what the recruitment's like. I think he's given young players an opportunity as well. But you know, it's um, I think the jury, to, to some extent, is out at the moment. But I, I think to change manager again at this stage, I mean, this constant chopping of changing managers just hasn't worked. I think at some stage you have to say, right, we trust the manager, we've got the money, we've got the structure in place, give him a bit of time. If after being given time, it doesn't work out. I mean, if you use this comparison, um, Mikel Arteta, this time last year, Arsenal fans were screaming blood and wants him out of the job because yeah. they had made the Champions League. You know, they, they were unhappy at the start, they made to the season. And, you know, the club didn't respond to that. They stuck with them. They could see the progress was being made. So you kind of hope that behind the scenes, you know, the club can see the progress is being made and he's given time to complete the job for which he was appointed. So let me put it, let me ask, ask you this. Do you think it's as simple as the lack of a reliable striker and the departure of Richarlison and a, a replacement of Neil Mope who really, I mean, it's not a replacement of Richarlison, let's be honest. Um, even though he could potentially fulfill a similar role, he's just not the same player. So do you think it's it's that simple? Well, it, 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 I mean, you have to be a certain age to understand this reference, but kind of replacing uh, Richarlison with Mopé is a bit like the Beatles replacing Paul McCartney with Jenny Marsden. There's absolutely, <laughs> n- n- there's absolutely, n- n- there's absolutely no comparison whatsoever. I mean, they're just different players. I mean, yeah. I think um, <clears throat> we were eternally grateful to Richarlison last season because his six goals in the last nine games got us over the line. And we haven't got anybody quite like him who can just provide that moment of unanticipated inspiration to turn games mm-hmm. in our favour. So he's a massive loss. Yes. Um, <clears throat> should we have bought an established striker early on the early on the transfer window? Undoubtedly, yes. I think there's such an over reliance on Calvert Luna at the moment that it, it, I, I just think it, it's really put untold pressure on the guy to deliver week in week out. And I don't know what's like where you sit, but you know, last one or two games, the criticism you've been getting from people sitting near me about his efforts, his performance, it's been quite quite depressing to to have to listen to, and, and, and I just don't understand where that's coming from. Um, so I think our problems are a bit more deep rooted than just um, <clears throat> than just a striking position. I think creating chances is a bigger issue for me that we just don't seem to create enough opportunities to uh, to put teams under pressure. And one thing that's frustrated me constantly this season, and it, it, it really stood out to me in the Man United game and the Leicester game, is how tactically we allow the opposition team star player the freedom of the park. So when we play against Man United, Eriksen was constantly in space. No one closed him down. No one man marked it. He just picked his balls, picked his passes. No problem at all. The game against Leicester, exactly the same as James Madison. You know, you have to be a genius to work out Madison is going to cause you problems if you give him time and space on the ball. But once again, we let him dictate the play, dictate the flow, dictate the rhythm, and the outcome is we lose. So I think tactically, you know, in the midfield, the, the certain improvements need to be made there. So is the case of Cavalier who scored again, changed everything? No. Does it improve the team? Yes, but we need to improve in other areas as well. Yeah, that's... Uh... That's definitely true. I think when it comes to like uh, Lampard, I mean, from the from from every time I feel like I have a conversation with anybody about um about football, it very comes back to Lampard, and he's like, I, I mean, I'm talking about uh, football fans who, who aren't Evertonians. I feel like I've got to wear a T-shirt that says, "Yes, I back Lampard. <laughs> yes, I want him to <laughs> succeed." Because it's uh, the question is just relentless every single time. I don't think we can have a conversation about about him coming up and you. you you, you try and defend them, or you de- you defend them, and you get that sour face. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't get the sort of like uh, the, the, this ongoing sort of like 
it feels like a, like a campaign almost against him from kind of everybody. You know, it's a, I, I find it odd given, as Paul said, that the time he's had uh, Everton, the, the lack of the lack of uh, transfer window, he's had the, it's, he's, the amount he's had to deal with at Everton, what he walked into at Everton. He's like, yeah, he's had a, a heck of a lot to deal with. Certainly, we need more up front. I mean, kind of picking up where we left left off. <laughs> it feels like about a month ago now, doesn't it? Where we um when we last sort of spoke about where we were. It's certainly attacking areas. You need to do something. He's acknowledged as much as well. I think hasn't he? To be fair, in in some of the interviews yeah. he's done, um, I think with the Echo and one or two others, I think. So it's um you know it's so we'll we'll, we'll see what they'll bring. And I think it's it's clearly have to bring something in. Um, yeah, just it's got to try and hit the second part of the season running, uh, hit the ground running a bit really, and. Get off to a good start because it's um yeah it looks difficult and uh, if if we're going to move on to the cup game soon it's you know there's, there's a high prospect of season over by January isn't there really realistically you know what I mean so if we could get a few quick wins in the league if we could beat beat Wolves okay let's write off City if we get anything great you know if we can beat um Brighton beat Sheffield United um Southampton sorry yeah you know, if you know it's not unfeasible let's be let's be let's be optimistic you know for a change it's it's not unfeasible to have three wins out of four there. And if you get nine points out of them four, all right, you're out of the cup, say. But you're probably like, well, where would we be? 11th, 12th? Looking up rather than down? You know what I mean? So it's um, the opportunity is there, particularly if you get a, a bit of personnel in. But it could go either way. If you don't win, if you don't make progress in them games where we've got opportunities in, it's going to look like a very long, long, dark winter, isn't it? Having played both the Manchester teams in that time as well in the in the league and the cup. So, um, yeah, these next sort of four or five games are going to really be able to tell us where the season's going to be going. I, I had waves of positivity amidst that. There were some moments where I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess. And then, yeah, season over by January stood out a little bit as well. Um, I think those questions about Lampard, as, as you allude to, um, Paul T, they're they're often external. They're coming from other football fans, often who aren't really knowledgeable. And they they just they have Lampard as the lightning rod and they can they can chat about that and you and you do find yourself defending him. I think a lot of that context for the defence though, the longer time goes on and the more we are finding ourselves, as you said, Paul, and in a relegation dogfight potentially again, the more that defence just becomes we don't want to change manager because we've done it so often over the last few years. It becomes this that that's the context for it, really. We don't want more upheaval, and I guess the more time goes by, and that's our defence, there has to be more scrutiny of how we're playing under Lampard. Like you say, in terms of how we've fared tactically against sides, I, I, I completely agree on the uh, performances against Leicester and Manchester United. We we made it easy for two sides who, at that time, weren't exactly high on confidence, and I think that's what the fans will really want to see in that Wolves game, not just ourselves in a home game after this break everyone should be really well rested because the the fact is a lot of them weren't good enough to even be considered for their international sides so they've they're well rested going into a must-win game on a boxing day at Goodison there there should be a reaction from the players but also we 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 can't allow Wolves to get into the game and impose themselves we know that in those subsequent two games we are going to have to dig in a little bit and we're going to be lucky to get, say, a point at City or take, uh, you know, t- take Manchester United to... Uh, is, is there a replay in the third round anymore? Yeah, yeah I think Tell how, how well prepared I am today. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, on the heels of that Bournemouth for <laughs> standing <laughs> <one>. <laughs> But I think if we can get something from those games, that will be massive. But certainly that Wolves game, we need to... We need to give those fans as as much as we were saying before. They give the players so much, and we've 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 seen how they can drag certain individuals and the team collectively over the line. And certainly, how Lampard's bought into that is another big reason why, when people do question, we can quite confidently say, "No, he's he's our manager. That's that's who we want. Give him time. He's had less than a year. All the right noises." But the players need to give the fans something back in return, and and, and that Boxing Day game is a is a massive massive chance to do that and it's it's the best chance isn't it because as, as as we've said after that it's a it's a really tricky not nice run to be looking at um so a- any momentum we can take into the new year we've we've, we've got to, we've got to grab with both hands 
because yeah, if we don't get anything from the, those first three first three matches before the FA Cup tie, then you're going to Old Trafford with you know with all that sort of Premier League stress and baggage on your shoulders, having to sort of try and get something <laughs> away at one of one of our you know least productive grounds you know in, in recent history. Uh, have we almost written that cup tie off? Or are we hoping that that's going to be the uh, the springboard for, for something better? Because I, 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 as soon as the draw came out, I mean, I just, I just shrugged my shoulders and I said, "Well, they may as well rename themselves the Twenty Nine Campaign at this point because you know there goes, a, there goes another hope of a trip to Wembley." But I don't know, how, how do you see it? Oh, I, I, it's, uh, there's no no doubt it's incredibly tough to draw for us. Uh, I mean, my view would be that I think. It depends on a number of factors. One, what team do Man United put out? Do they do they put out their strongest team, or do they retake the squad and give some some of the fringe players an opportunity, which creates which creates a chance for us too? What team do we put out? Because mm-hmm. I think for that kind of game, we put out our strongest team. You know, we 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 try and you know, put in a performance. You know, a draw wouldn't be a bad result. Bring the back to Goodison Park for a midweek nighttime replay. I, I'd be more than happy with that. I think as well. I mean. Lots of people these days are quite dismissive of the FA Cup, but I still think it has a huge importance in changing seasons. I know, looking back to Harry Kendall years, that 84 season, when, um, although the Oxford United League Cup game gets lots of the credit, I remember the third round tie that season, the way Stoke City was went to, and we won 2-0, and the atmosphere and the support for the team there actually generated a momentum that took us through to win the Cup that season. So, um, it... If I'm being honest, you know, we're going to struggle to get anything from that game. But if we feel our strongest team, if United don't, then, you, know, you never know. You, you, it's a cup game. You know, we, we've got a chance. And uh, I just I agree with what Adam Paul said there, you know, what you said as well. And then we can't be, we can't go into the first weekend in, uh, in January having lost to Wolves, having lost to City, maybe not got a point against Brighton, then knocked out the cup. Because I just think then the whole milestone of pressure that mm-hmm. surrounds the management team is going to become in- insufferable. And it, it really just, I mean, you think, you'd like to think players can respond to tension. But, but, but you know, it's like when you work sometimes, yeah, there's a pressure situation where some people respond, some people don't. I'm not quite sure how intrinsically re- resilient some of our players are at the moment. The thing, uh, <clears throat> my worry with the Man U game um, is, is that it, if, well, if we do have that, like uh, the, the results do go poorly before that, there's even more chance he's going to rest players because he's going to think, oh, blimey, I don't want to get you know him injured for this game. you know. So and it's fighting on the Tuesday night and then, man, you three days later. Um, that, uh, yeah, I think all Evertonians would say, you know, they, we, we really do value the Cups because we'd love to bloody win one if I, you know, if, you know, for, 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 the, for the change. But I just look at the way Premier League teams perform in the Cups now and they, they seem to, like, every single one of them almost, if not all of them, well, they'll just rest players throughout, from from round three right through, or and or from in the League Cup as well, from the second round right through until, you know, you bundle your way through like by resting seven, eight players or so, and then oh bloody hell, we're in the quarters, we're in the semi here, and then you'll sort of start like turn on. Mm-hmm. And the, the reason, if you look at like the history of the last sort of ten years or so, who's won it? Um, it's you know in in the in the in the last ten years, it's only what Wigan who've won and and Leicester during COVID who've won the uh, FA Cup. Yeah. League Cup in the last 10 years, Swansea, the only team, out, all of them outside the top four who've won it. So it's, it's, it's slim pickings that City have won the League Cup six times. And that, you know what I mean? So, and, and you don't tell me City have played their best team in every round. They've got to the semis, but the, the fact is the teams in the top sort of four, five, six, their second strings are way better than the second strings lower down the leagues. The, mm-hmm. the, the teams lower down the leagues feel they can't afford to, you know, to put their best players out because the Premier League is too valuable, too important. Even if you're talking teams are going for oh different team finishing 14th and 10th, it's about, oh, that's about 25 million quid. I can't afford to do that. It's ridiculous, but that's the way it's gone. You know, I mean, it's um, it's a real shame, and that's kind of the way the cup's gone. I'd, I'd love us to go and win the cup. I'll, I'll be going to Old Trafford. I'll be, you know, I, you know, we'll be cheering them on and hoping for the best. But I think the reality is we'll we'll be going there with probably half a dozen changes. Man City make half a dozen changes, but such as the quality that they've got, they'll, they'll probably wipe the floor of us, and that's that's the sad likelihood of of. Uh, and, and you might probably, you know, romantically, I'd love us to go like, all right, man, you're rest. If you we go there, put off, put a 
best foot forward, take them back to Goodison, you know what I mean? Like we did in, like we did with Liverpool, for example, in, in, uh, in 2009. And we, you know, we, we, and, that, and that did not ignite that second of the season a bit as well. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So like, you know, an ideal world. Yeah. I'm always got the importance of that sort of stuff, I think. You know what I mean? But these days it's just, you know, they're nearly all teams. All that, and that's what just needs to be so sort of like, oh God, when that, when that comes around and, I just wish we get a bit more luck with draws as well. I mean, we got like, I don't know, last, uh, uh, what we got, tw- last sort of League Cup, League Cup um, and the FA Cup over the last five years and discounted the COVID season. We've had eight at home and 13 away. You know what I mean? So it's uh, it's very, mm. very, very imbalanced in how many away games. When we've had the, the third round games, we've had Liverpool away against top Premier League teams, we've had Liverpool away twice and now Man U away. We ask them that much really to have, I don't know, Bolton at home or something like that. Just you know, just for once, you know. I mean, it just feels like everything's always yeah. away. And then, yeah. So, I'd love to love us to go and go and go and do well in the cup. You know, we can ignite the season, even if you don't go and win it. But uh, the cynic in me, yeah, suggested suggest otherwise, and history backs that up. Unfortunately. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, I think um, you know Joe Royal's season when he won the cup. This just shows yeah. you that it doesn't have to be a, uh, doesn't have to be a drag on your league season. It can actually be the opposite. Um, and and I agree. I mean that the FA Cup. I think the FA Cup final in '86 was the first Everton match that I actually watched. Um, and you know, regardless of of, of that fact, I mean, the, I, I'm just sort of dismayed at the, the way that the the magic of the FA Cup has just kind of been eroded over the years. Um, first, because of just you know the the all-consuming power of the Premier League, but also uh, as you were saying, Paul, the uh, you know this 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 dominance that the, the top teams have had over in recent years. So I'd love us to you know to take that first step and and knock United out and and, and have a proper go at it. And I actually think, I mean, depending on how these, these those the results go in those three games before it, I think if we haven't done so well, I think. Lampard will actually probably go for a stronger team, like like he did at Crystal Palace last season. I think he will. Um, I think he'll need to. I think he's going to need the boost. You know, he's going to need the, uh, the 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 fillip that you can get from from. Let's face it, would be a a real shot in the arm to to win that one. Yeah, that's like yeah, that's that's probably true. I was I was kind of thinking about the, thinking about the other way a little bit, maybe that if we do beat you know, say we beat Wolves, lose City, beat Brighton. Then it's like, well, we got Man U three days, four days after that, whatever. But then you got a whole week or so until you know the next game at Southampton. So it kind of feels like, right, come on, let's have a good push at this one, and you know what I mean. We can, uh, and uh, yeah, then you got a whole over the week off then. So I'd maybe look at, it, think of it part the other way. But I hadn't really factored in the pressure he'd be under. Ha, ha, should the results not go so well, so you might, yeah, he might be backed into a corner, I suppose, to sort of maybe create a, create a result. And look, we've got nine and a half thousand tickets for that game. There's going to be a lot of blues to, yeah, a lot, yeah. a lot of blues there. So mm-hmm. he'll be making some noise, and yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to let them down. Yeah, and we've got two home games either side of it that mm. are on the more winnable side. So it's either a great distraction that could provide some momentum, or it's or it's a way to keep a keep a winning feeling going potentially. That's obviously the best case scenario, um, because then again you start looking at the fixtures past that, and it it starts to get worrying again through February. You re- you really want January to end with all of these worries that we've expressed going into this about about Everton being back in our lives uh, full time. You want these worries to have gone away, whether that's addressing the issues in the transfer market on the particularly in the top half of a pitch removing those doubts about Lampard tactically and also crucially just moving us up the table and away from that that Russian roulette situation as you said earlier Paul because we, we don't want to be worrying about that towards the end of January and we've I don't know we've, we've tried to sign someone on loan who's now like you said Lyndon earlier hopelessly out of our reach we've tried to get Gakpo on loan uh, it, 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 it's, it's not what we want Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's another one as well, isn't it? Another, another one who got away. <laughs> the result um, of this, of, you know, of our concerns and our worries over the potential relegation and the team's form, it inevitably sort of gives rise to people questioning the hierarchy and the board. And obviously, we've had this uh, latest open letter from the 27 came campaign to Fahad Mashiri demanding. You know, 
I, I think first and foremost, the demand for communication is, is, is definitely a fair one. I think particularly around the stadium funding, um, there are legitimate concerns or legitimate, there's a legitimate, legitimate need for clarification on just where, uh, where we stand with that. And, you know, just to, to alleviate the fears that this thing is going to get funded to its completion. And then we'll worry about, you know, whether the club sold or, or what, what, whatever happens after that. Um, but Bashiri has clearly taken a step back. Uh, I think his lack of visibility at the matches um, and the fact that he only re- we only really hear from him when the 27 campaign have sort of prompted something with an open letter or, or, or the, the leaking thereof um, beforehand. Um, I, so I suspect that, you know, that, that he is looking for his exit. But you know, the question crops up, well, why are we in this situation that we're in? And, and we all know why, because we've been discussing and talking about it for years. You know, we, we overspent on um, substandard players. We've paid them too much in wages. We've gone way over the FFP um, limits. And now we're, we're, we're paying that price. And I think that, uh, you know, we've talked a lot on this podcast about Mashiri. A Mashiri that, that's learned his lessons is, is sticking around isn't necessarily um, the worst thing. And, and it might not be that he's learned his lessons. It might just be that he's taken his hands off the tiller and that the likes of Bill Kenwright and Denise Barrett Baxendale have had to step in and in tandem with Kevin Thelwell, um, you know, resolve some of those or, or deal with some of those those issues or those situations that Rashi was having a direct influence in that he, that he currently isn't anymore. Uh, and so I think if you look at it from that perspective, um, you know, how, how, how much how much you, you you how much how much you put in the strategic review that they under, undertook, but it, you know, they have they have made a commitment to look at how the club is run and they have made, they have taken steps to address that. And I think Farewell's appointment and the fact that he has been allowed to sort of more or less get on with the job is one positive. Um, I think the fact that you've got people like Tim Cahill getting involved and advising the board, someone who is not only knowledge of the club, but is clearly sort of making strides uh, in other areas of his football career um, and, and becoming a bit of a mover, shake, mover and shaker in the global game. I think that's a positive development. Um, and, you know, for all Ken Wright's faults, and, you know, I've written plenty of words about Bill Kenwright on Toffee Web, um, particularly around the whole um, Kirby move, which, you know, that's, there's, there's plenty there. Um, but I mean, Ken Wright is, for all his faults, respected in the game as a negotiator. Um, and some of these, some of these more complex deals, or, or some of these more difficult deals, or in the more impressive deals, even you know, there's there's a case to be said that he was involved in those and helped get them over the line. Um, so, f- for me, again, you know, just sort of sweeping the board clean now at this point as an immediate step, I don't think it's going to solve our problems. Um, but certainly, it's uh, well, 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 well worth um, considering going forward uh, well I, I'd agree about the communication point in London I think you know the, the, the lack of, of uh, background information from, from, from the top of the club has been quite appalling over the last few years and uh, I think you know it's quite right the questions are raised about the financial probity of the club where's the money coming from who who's 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 funding the stage of development how, how's it going to be how's it going to generate profits for the club and the ownership so I, I think those quick questions are quite justified I think you know I, I think like many people, I, I just share massive concerns by the kind of constitution of the boardroom because you know, when you think what one of the board one of the boardroom members now is Graham Sharp. Now, mm. in all fairness to Graham Sharp, he's not gonna be spending hours poring over the accounts, digging deep to try and find out where the money's coming from. He's purely there, I think, to kind of allay fans' fears like this somebody you can trust he's on the board, which he might well be, but I think you know uh, there's there seems to be it's always a concern because Feta, I think what you have at Everson is an oligarchy where one person is in charge with a few token people kind of surrounding him. And whether that's a whether that's a, that's a, a model for success in the modern game, I, 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 I'm really not quite sure. Um, you know, obviously, we were grateful for Michel for coming in and giving us the financial support. But then, you know, on every level since then, his decision has been, been, been quite woeful. And you know, if if he was a director of a large private company, 
then the shareholders would have been moved them by now for underperformance. So uh, I think, yeah, I agree with you that I don't think it's the time for wholesale changes at this stage in the season. But, you know, and there's all this talk of bringing another investor on board. Well, who who's that likely to be? What influence are they going to have? And it's uh, it just seems I mean, I, I wouldn't for one second claim to be an expert in finances. Uh, but I do have a good idea how, how what effective governance looks like, and I think you know if you if you're the if you're charged with stewardship of the club, then you ha- you are accountable and you have to respond to fans' requests. That doesn't necessarily mean that F has to change, but I think a lot of these fears could have been allayed by better communication. And I still think that the one he's made many misjudgments with Mr. Sherry, but the one calamitous one he made was going against all the advice and feelings of the fans and points in back from Benitez. And I, I, that was the day I lost faith until then I had faith. Once Benitez was appointed, I definitely changed my, 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 my opinion towards the ownership of the club. It's how much is, um, what, 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 what position are we in here? Because like it, it's, it's, since obviously it was Osman office, it's should be Osman office basically in charge from what I do. Basically, yeah, 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 basically. But now it's just like, it's a, I mean, how many plasters can we put on this now until we get some like proper investor in? I mean, I, I you know, I don't know, I, I don't know anything really about the about the finances, how it's run, but we had real problems, haven't we, with uh, FFP? Um, and then obviously with Osmanov, I don't know how much. Yeah, you know, I'm speculating entirely. I don't know whether how much Osmanov has been like. Oh, you know, I don't, I don't like that manager. Anyway, get get rid of him. Mashiri's had to sort of listen to what Osmanov's got to say, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't know, but I don't know if Mashiri's been making these calls or has it been the man above him who's been making these calls on like, right, we need a good manager. We need right, Raf, get that Rafa Benitez. You know what I mean? And I don't, I don't know. I'm again I'm speculating, but um. The situation we found ourselves in, <clears throat> and how nobody could have foreseen what would have happened, obviously with uh, with Russia and Ukraine and the sanctions and having you know having to lose Osmanov um, in that regard. Um, but yeah, just the, the situation we found, we found ourselves in, it's just uh, it, it's quite scary, uh, I think, really. And certainly, we need better communication from it. There's probably stuff they, they probably don't want to tell us. I imagine there's, a, there's probably a lot going on. I. I, I I, it strikes me that, that Mashiri would be desperate to get out now. To be honest, that, 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 that's the that's the persona I get because he's just invisible. You know what I mean? He's, he's, yeah, you, know, you don't you don't hear or see a thing from him. Um, I worry we found ourselves in a heck of a hole there. Um, without him until that white knight comes along, who, who wants to invest a bit a bit in us. Then I don't really see I don't really see the way out, but. That's me going on just a gut feeling from it about you know about a deep knowledge of how the finances really run. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's a worry which, quite frankly, I try to try to forget all about until, until it's until it's uh, we hear something and it's one day resolved. Um, but yeah, I just don't know how it become, how that turns and I don't know how that impacts on finances and we say no, we need to get this attacker in or winger in or striker in or whatnot and how much that impacts on that too. I'm not so sure. And then we've got silly stuff like, you know, we've got, we're gonna, probably going to gonna be getting Deli Alley back and not be able to play him because we're going to pay 10 million quid if we do and stuff like that. It just feels like amateur, you know, amateur hour really, doesn't it, at times? A lot of the time. So, like, um, good thing, good news is the stadium. We, we know that. And they, they don't often like telling us about that. And that's the one thing that's, uh, <laughs> that's there. But, um, yeah, without knowing a lot about the finances and how it all works, I do worry about the situation we found ourselves in for the aforementioned reasons. Yeah, I, I agree with all of the above. I think obviously the longer that period of silence goes on, the more these questions are going to keep cropping up. The last we heard from Missouri, we quickly had a, a whole raft of rumours about new ownership. So I think I think you're completely right, Paul. I think he, he wants out and he probably doesn't want to play his hand and and suggest how bad the situation is. I think to go back to the 27 campaign, it's it's Gallo's humour to suggest that it's a campaign that's going to have to keep changing its name. But it's <laughs> it's it's frustrating. It's a it's a sign it's a sign of frustration that we all feel and we all share. But I I I do completely agree, Lyndon, but I think the last thing um we really want to do is rip that band-aid off at this at this juncture in the season when there are, there are so many things at play in a bit of a scary world and there's no scary world to be in than uh, that of an Evertonian. I think making sure that 
we have our safety secured, but there's some sort of direction to this season. If if we were to finish 16th and we could have some sort of summer of regrouping and maybe that's the time then to mobilise this sort of support and, and really hit home and say, that's two seasons in a row. It, it ain't going to be as easy next time around. We need to yeah. we need to make sure that history doesn't keep repeating itself. I think that would be a better time to mobilise rather than a time where the only mobilising we really want to do is is to try and get behind the team and recognise that, yep, we're not where we want to be, but to to stay where we're at, we need to kind of all be on, on the same page, even if it's not necessarily the people who we'd want to share that page with in a, in a lot of respects. So, and, and I'm, sh- I'm sure Missouri feels the same way. I, I, I think there is certainly an exit plan happening somewhere behind the scenes and we probably won't know about. It. I just hope that however this marriage comes to an end, it's it's a, it's as civil as possible and that it, it doesn't leave us in the lurch in the way that a lot of other kind of big giants of the English game fell by the wayside in the, in the sort of early noughties, the likes of Leeds, likes of Sheffield Wednesday. Um, we've seen it with Sunderland, Villa for a time as well, where that ownership when it falls out the bottom can really leave a, a hell of a vacuum. Um, so I, that's, that's all I hope, but it's, it's certainly not all rosy news, is it? I think that's, that's what we can all probably yeah. agree on. No, I, th- I think the nightmare so Adam would be that if Michery does decide to sell, he sells some like Ashley. Wow. Just stop me in my tracks there, Paul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, need, to, need to lie down after that. <laughs> and I suppose. That takes us to our uh, to our well weekly question. At this point, what is it? Our fortnightly question. Uh, in, in light of the uh, the current Arctic blast that's uh, uh, afflicting the UK, the question this week is: What is the coldest Everton match that you can remember attending? And I'll let whoever wants to jump in first go ahead. Well, before the pod started, I was speaking to Adam and I was just saying that, you know, that this is the longest time I can recall at this period of, of the year that I've gone without watching Everson from like the, the early November to the end of December. And I mentioned the only other time that's comparable to, in my experience, watching Everson was the winter of 62-63, which, is a, a, which I think it's been the second coldest winter we've had since the Second World War. And I was, I was seven then and uh, I was at home the, the snow was all around. We would go to school in like two, three foot of snow every day. I had chill blains for the first time in my life. And on the Saturday morning, my dad suddenly suggested, do you fancy going to watch Everson away at Blackburn? So obviously I, I jumped at the chance. It was absolutely freezing all the way to, to the train station. Got the train to Blackburn, uh, got off Blackburn. If I thought it was cold in Liverpool, Blackburn was something else. Blackburn was even more cold than what Liverpool had been. Uh, it, it was like going from you know, Bermuda to the Baltic. It, it, it was just so cold and horrible, dark, grim. It was, and uh, we got off the train of Blackburn and the sleet started just, just lashing it down. So I was drenched before I'd even got to the stadium at the time. My feet were soaking wet. It was a horrible day. And it was my first Everton game. And uh, when we got to the stadium... It, would give, it gave me a full taste of what it was going to be like supporting Everson because we were top of the table when we went to that game. We It was nil a half time. The second half, they had to bring out an audience ball because the, the, the conditions were so arctic light. The floodlights were on. The snow was sleeting down. We went one nil up. Blackburn pulled the back 2-1 each. We went 2-1 up. Blackburn got back to two each. A certain Fred Pickering scored. It might ring the bell with some people. And then in the last minutes of the game, Blackburn got a dodgy penalty and one three two, and the outcome was we were knocked off the top of the tail by Tottenham Hotspur. And my abiding memory of coming away from that game, apart from being absolutely frozen, I, 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 I'm sure I've still got the effects of that now uh, with frostbite and things. <laughs> it's the only time in my life when the guards van on the train on the way home, and um, the guard decided to share his flask of Oxo with us. I've never t- tasted anything so disgusting in my life. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> so uh, it, it, it really was a, an occasion I, I've never forgotten. It was the coldest I've ever been in a football match. And I've been to some cold venues since then, but that was that nothing to compare with that. Well, I'll take some beating, won't it? Uh, <laughs> the um, mine, um, it, I think it's the one with your your favourite uh, Everton goal, and then the uh, Stephen Pienaar little dink at the uh, the Emirates <laughs> over yeah. over the keeper. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 great goal. Yeah, uh, I, I went down to that one, and there was a big freeze. Obviously, it was like I think it was a like minus ten, maybe maybe even colder, and. Um, I drove down, things you do when you're younger, I suppose. I, I, I drove down in my uh, old Nissan Almeida. It was, it was that cold. It, it, it was that ridiculous. Pretty damn dangerous thinking about it. The um, drive down the, the windscreen wiper, was, it, was, it was just frozen. All the fluids up, was absolutely frozen. So couldn't couldn't use the windscreen wiper. So we just had a bottle of water. And every so often we'd pull over and just pour the water on the thing and then just get, get <laughs> and so you could just, and you know, just like really, it was, but again, ridiculous in hindsight. But then, yeah, that's when we're getting there. It was so cold, but I suppose when it's a good game, you kind of forget about it a little bit. And um, yeah, it's a shame we never won that one, wasn't it? It was a last minute Thomas Ozeski equaliser, which I think took a deflection or something. I forget, but that was, uh, yeah, a great day out. Meal, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So it was a great day. Shame we didn't hold on. Um, I remember Jimmy James Vaughan missing a good chance to make a free one not too long before that as well. And we could have won that one. Um, but yeah, very, very cold um, day. And I think there was, that was only one of two games which went ahead that day. Because the rest of all the, all the other games were, were called off because of the weather. Yeah, you've never been so cold. The only other one that sprung to mind was probably Bate Borisov at home when there was hardly anybody there at Goodison Park. And obviously, you're not really like, you can normally rely on the people around you to provide a bit of body warmth <laughs> because there was nobody there. <laughs> was just, that, was, that was very tough. But um, yeah, just temperature temperature alone, I'd have to go for, in, for the Arsenal game. People talk about the Nuremberg game being completely, re- really cold. Was that not up there with it? I don't know. Um, it, I can't remember, but it, it must have been freezing, obviously. But I can't remember there uh, a great deal. But we were right up at the back of the. We were in the um, we, we were, uh, the, the, the big home end. We were right at the very back of it. I can't remember that how 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 cold it was. To be honest, probably plenty of uh, yeah. plenty of alcohol in me to keep me to keep me warm. Probably. I, I was going to say, yeah. yeah <laughs> probably, probably helped a little bit. Um, I can't really recall if I'm honest with you. I was in, actually another one. I was in Germany um, earlier this year though. This is a, this is an Everton game, but my father-in-law bought me uh, for my birthday. Got me a ticket for Chemnitz versus uh, Dynamo Berlin, and. Um, it was freezing, really, really. It was like, I've never seen icicles in April. It was absolutely freezing. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, the novelty, obviously, being like on, on, on the continent, mostly you can get a beer while you're watching the game. And it's got this beer. it was so cold. And it wasn't fair. So it, it felt like a novelty at the time. I felt, oh, I'm going to have a beer and watch the game. But um, yeah, I had to ditch that idea and go for a coffee because it was just so uh, so cold there. And the game was I don't know, like sixth division German league or something like that. So it wasn't, I guess, if the game's poor, you really notice the cold a lot more. You know what I mean? And that was uh, one of them games, yeah. which which was the case. Yeah, I was going to say that. I think maybe those sort of away days of the likes of Nuremberg, you're probably there bouncing a few beers deep. It, <laughs> it kind of takes takes a lot of that cold away. Um, I, I can't top those stories. I'd say um, I, I do remember going to um, it was Derby away um, with my dad and. Um, I think I think Nick Barnby might have scored, but I'm pretty sure we got beat two one. Really poor game, um, and I, I remember it being freezing. But I do remember um, I do remember meeting Duncan McKenzie, and uh, that was that, that was that was a really nice moment in the cold. But um, but but the main thing I remember taking away from it was my dad had a an old blue Ford Escort. It was a dreadful car, and it was just no, no heating on. I just I just remember that that trudge up the M1 when you've got beaten and you've just sat there politely as you've watched us succumb to a really, really poor away performance. Yeah. remember that being pretty chilly. Uh, but yeah, probably not going to be a, a Pinar goal in the snow or uh, or, uh, or or yours, Paul, up in uh, Blackburn. Uh, great stories. Yeah, the, the point about having enough people around you to keep you warm, I think, is the point of one. Because the, the things, I can't remember a specific match where i was the coldest but i remember just i have memories of standing on on sparsely populated terraces with just absolutely frozen feet and you know and you're constantly shifting your feet to try and keep yourself warm um 
But I, I, the one that always pops into my head, and it might not have been the coldest one I've ever been to, but it, it just felt that way. It was my very first Everton match. The first time at Goodison, we were up in the top balcony. It was November, so it was you know cold. The wind was whipping off the Mersey, and it was a um, goalless draw with Liverpool. I cannot remember a single thing about the match because it was that bad. And I think that whole, <laughs> just that whole memory, just, it just, I just remember being cold and, and, and dreary. <laughs> so I think that's probably mine. <laughs> yeah, I think there's something there. And I did the worst the game, the, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 yeah, the colder you feel for sure. Um, so I remember, being, yeah, well, I, I remember, only remember, obviously, because of the circumstance, the Arsenal game. The two all draw because um, the, the circumstance of the weather. I don't really recall it being freezing when I was there. Obviously, it was, but because the game was so exciting, you kind of forget that. Bati mm-hmm. Bovasov, for example, I remember it being cold because it was just awful. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. yeah, definitely <laughs> the game dictates the quality of the game dictates that. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Uh, thanks very much, gents, for a great chat about all things Everton and the World Cup. Um, we'll be back. Actually, we'll be back in fairly short order. Our um, absent friend today, Andy Howard, has uh, prepared a, a Toffee Web quiz. So we will uh, see what that's all about. Uh, and we'll be obviously that much closer to, to Wolves. And maybe we'll have some indications about which players are going to be available and perhaps the, uh, the fitness of one uh, Dominic Calvert Lewin. Uh, so until then, Blues, uh, enjoy the rest of the World Cup and uh, stay warm. And uh, we'll catch up with you very soon. Thanks for tuning in.